This is the day that the Lord hath made, and I will rejoice, and I will be glad in it. I'm Bishop Marcus A. Johnson, Sr., your host today on the New Harvest Midday Inspirational Mealtime. And we have been having quite an interesting discussion this entire week as we have feasted on the concept, the principle, the factor of the love of God. The love of God, it, it's, it's not just a little small little something. The love of God is unfathomably large and huge and infinite and capable of achieving all things, everything. Whatever it is that God desires to do, his love can handle it. I'm so glad that you joined me again today. I want to encourage you to please hit that like button so that we will raise our numbers and draw others to our page, that they will hear these truths and also be able to be nourished by it. Let's pray now and ask God's blessings on this lesson. If there's somebody you need to contact, call and tell them, oh, you want to tune in, you want to tune in live, or you want to listen to this even after it's recorded, please do so, so that they can enjoy and appreciate the present, the precious word of God that speaks to each of us right now. Let's pray. Father, there's so much that we have to thank you for. First and foremost, we thank you for God. We thank you for who you are. Our Father, we thank you that you are the Son of God, our Savior. We thank you that you are the Holy Spirit that is the power of God dwelling in us. And we're so glad that we have the document of your heart. And that's the Word of God. And that's what we are feasting upon and exploring today. Bless this lesson as we continue to pursue your truth. Speak to us. Grow us, correct us, perfect us until we look just like Jesus. And we give you the glory and the honor on behalf of all of your children, even those who've not yet come to you, but their names are already slated. We pray, God, that you will draw all souls unto you. Use us as your witnesses. And we give you the glory and the honor. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Beloveds, God is good, and God is good all the time because God is love. We've been looking in this new series, What is Love? And we have come to understand that the very root of all that God does is love. Why? Because at the core of who God is, is love. And so God doesn't have to work towards it. It's just his nature. And so the lesson today, what should the love of God look like in our lives? What should the love of God look like in our lives? Well, we've discovered that because the life of a Christian really should be overflowing with love. And that's not a make-believe thing. That's not a pretentious thing. That should be authentic and earnest because Christ dwells in us. And God extended his love to us through his son, Jesus Christ. God is love. And so we'll be looking today for our lesson text coming out of 1 Corinthians 13. But let's first read, listen to this expanded principle this expanded principle. I've been giving you a principle this week, but I've expanded it throughout this week. Listen to this. Since whom God is, is what God does. Love is God being himself, existing and acting according to his divine nature, enabling his children to acquire his nature and live accordingly. Therefore, during this dark world, we should easily be seen as children of the Lord, children of light and children of God's love. And so utilizing that concept, that principle, that principle that God is just being himself and as his children, we should accordingly in a dark age be seen as his children, children of the light and children of God's love. 
Let's look at 1 Corinthians 13, 1 through 3. Oh Lord, speak to each one of us. Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not love or charity, I am become as a sounding brass and a tinkling cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains and have not charity, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned and have not charity, it profiteth me nothing. We've heard this. Paul is teaching to the church in Corinth, and they were really caught up in all the gifts. And, oh, they were having a time. And there was a lot of confusion there, too, because they weren't being led by the Spirit in the usage of these gifts. They weren't operating by love. And therefore, a good thing can become a bad thing. The gifts that are good became complicated because it wasn't being controlled by the Holy Spirit, which is to be activated by love. Highlight number one, listen clearly as God speaks to each and every one of us. The love of God in our lives should appear consistent with the gifts and fruits of the Spirit. Did you hear that? There should be a consistency of the love of God in our lives. It should look like the gifts and the fruit of the Spirit. It should look like that. Did you hear what I'm saying? And it should not, the love of God in our lives should not look like this over here. And then the gifts of the Spirit and the fruit of the Spirit look like something like something else over there. No, there should be a consistency. 1 Corinthians 13, 1 through 3, from the translation Living Bible. Listen to this. If I had the gift of being able to speak in other tongues without learning them and could speak in every language there is in all of heaven and earth. That's a powerful, powerful feat. But didn't love others? I would only be making noise. If I had the gift of prophecy and knew all about what is going to happen in the future, knew everything about everything. This is hypothetical, of course. But didn't love others? What good would it do? Paul is making a comparison here. He's showing a contrast so that he drives his point home. If I accomplish the zenith, so to speak, and yet don't have love, it is a waste of time. If I had the gift of faith, he said, so that I could speak to a mountain and make it move, I would still be worth nothing at all without love. If I gave everything that I have to poor people, and if I were burned alive for preaching the gospel but didn't love others, it would be of no value whatever. Here's the insight number one. Insight number one. Now, Paul is really making an extreme, extreme comparison here because he wants to drive the point home. Whereas people are moved by demonstrative gifts of speaking in tongues, xenolalia, that's speaking a language you did not learn, by the Spirit, listen, prophecy to predict the future, faith to perform great feats, large giving, sacrificial benevolence, and martyrdom, dying for a worthy cause. God only credits the works performed out of true love. Did you hear that? Because God is the only one that's going to be able to reward. I'm talking about ultimately reward. Reward in the end. Only God can do that. And he's only going to credit, not by the size of the gift, not even by the size of the works or deeds. It's going to be based upon the heart, the works that are performed out of true love. My God, this is powerful. This is powerful. First Corinthians 3, 12 through 13 from the King James Version. Listen, now, if any man built upon this foundation, gold, silver, precious stones, those are three types of precious metals. But then he goes on, or wood, hay, or stubble. They are very perishable, y'all. Every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire, 
and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. So if it's made out of precious stones or made out of precious material, it will last the fire. It will survive the fire. The fire will refine it. But if it's made out of perishable, it won't last. It may have existed, but it won't last. Tip number one. Let's remember any works performed outside of God's love is short-lived and results in no eternal rewards. It is short-lived and results in no eternal rewards. 1 Corinthians 3, 14 through 15, King James Version. If any man's works abide, which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive a reward if it outlasts the test of time, the fire. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. 1 Corinthians 13, verses 4 through 7. Charity suffereth long and is kind. Charity envieth not, not envieth not, Charity vaunteth not itself, it is not puffed up, doth not behave itself unseemly, seeketh not her own, is not easily provoked, thinketh no evil, rejoiceth not in iniquity, but rejoiceth in the truth, beareth all things, believeth all things, hopeth all things, endureth all things. That's the very nature of love. When I say charity, I mean love. It beareth all things, it believeth all things, it hopeth all things, endureth all things. Now, this is being led by the Spirit of God, of course. Highlight number two. The love of God in our lives should appear as the fruit of the Spirit and not the works of the flesh. What? That's right. The love of God in our lives should not look like the works of the flesh. Let's examine the works of the flesh and compare it with the fruit of the Spirit. Galatians 5, 19 to 23, look at this. Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these. These are the deeds of the flesh, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, that's lewd living, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, Emulating, trying to be like somebody else. Wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings. Come on. Murders, drunkenness, revelings. Can't get along with anybody. And such like. The list can go on even. Of the which I tell you before, as I have also told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. And God has so much for the people of God to inherit as the heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ Jesus. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such, there is no law. So in other words, there's nothing that can counter the fruit of the Spirit. Nothing that can, that can outrule it. But the works of the flesh, it's a mess. And the pleasure is so short-lived and so temporary. And the reward of it, short-lived and temporary. But the fruit of the Spirit, wow, it has eternal ramifications. Insight number two. Whereas some deeds can appear externally as good works, internally, they do not ripen or sometimes are rotten to the core. So be careful when people are giving you compliments and, and sometimes even giving you gifts and doing things. Be careful by being pulled in by that because it's really what comes from the heart that really matters. Matthew 23, verses 1 through 7. Let's listen to an example of what may appear on the outside but is something different on the inside. Matthew 23, 1 through 7. Then spake Jesus to the multitude and to his disciples, saying, 
the scribes and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. All therefore whatsoever they bid you observe, that observe and do. But do not ye after their works, for they say and do not. For they bind heavy burdens and grievous to be borne, and lay them on men's shoulders. But they themselves will not move, move them with one of their fingers. They, they wear all this heavy stuff to appear to be all that, their garments and so forth. But yet they're not willing to do anything for the good of another. But all their works they do to be seen of men. They make broad their phylacteries and enlarge the borders of their garments. So they, they wear all this stuff that, that has religious uh, uh, symbolism and love the uppermost rooms at feast and the chief seats in the synagogues. They want to look important and greetings in the markets and to be called of men, rabbi, rabbi. They're all in the titles. Tip number two, let's remember any works performed outside of the love of God are unacceptable unto God. If it's not done from a pure heart, the love of God, the love for God, then it is of no significance to God at all. It's unacceptable. Now, look at Matthew chapter 6. Jesus is teaching on the Sermon on the Mount. Let's look at verses 1 through 2, verse 5, and verse 16. Matthew 6, 1 through 2. Take heed that you do not your arms before men to be seen of them. Otherwise, you have no reward of your Father which is in heaven. Therefore, when thou doest thine alms, when thou gives, this is about giving, do not sound the trumpet before thee as the hypocrites do in the synagogue and in the streets that they may have glory of men. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. That's about giving. They're giving to be seen. Now, let's look at praying. And when thou prayest, thou shalt not be as the hypocrites are. For they love to pray standing in the synagogues and in the corners of the streets, that they may be seen of men. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. When they pray just to be heard and admired and to enamor men and women and children, boys and girls, when they hear their words, God is saying there's no eternal reward for that. Fasting. Moreover, when you fast, be not as the hypocrites of a sad countenance, for they disfigure their faces that they may appear unto men to fast. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. They're all doing this for show. They give, they pray, and they fast, but it's not from the love of God in their heart. It's for a show, form and fashion. Highlight number three, highlight number three, bear with me now, the love of God in our lives should always appear appealing unto God. The love of God in our lives should always appear appealing unto God. 1 Samuel 16, verses 1 through 7. Now here's an example of looking at the outward appearance, and it can deceive us. Look at this. This is a very well-known text in the Old Testament. And the Lord said unto Samuel, Samuel the prophet, How long wilt thou mourn for Saul, seeing I have rejected him from reigning over Israel? Fill thine horn with oil and go, and I will send thee to Jesse the Bethlehemite. For I have provided me a king among his sons. Now, those of you that know the story, and for those who don't, so now Saul, who was the first king of Israel, because the people rejected God, they wanted a king, a human king, like all the other nations, the pagan nations around them. So God gave them what they wanted, and they chose Saul, and God gave him to them. But Saul had a heart problem. Saul had a heart condition, and he did not have the love of God. And so therefore, Saul uh, disobeyed God and saw Samuel, I'm sorry, and, and, and Samuel, the prophet, was, was really brokenhearted over this. And God said, stop crying over Saul. I've rejected him. 
I have someone else in Jesse's house, a Bethlehemite. He is going to be the king of Israel. I'm going to replace Saul. And Samuel said, how can I go? If Saul hear it, he will kill me. And the Lord said, take an heifer with thee and say, I am come to sacrifice to the Lord. And call Jesse to the sacrifice, and I will show thee what thou shalt do. And thou shalt anoint unto me him whom I name unto thee. So God is saying, you go to his house, I'll protect you, but I'm going to raise up another king. And Samuel did that which the Lord spake, and came to Bethlehem. And the elders of the town trembled at his coming and said, Comest thou peaceably? Are we in trouble with God? When they saw a prophet coming. And he said, Peaceably, I am come to sacrifice unto the Lord. Sanctify yourselves and come with me to the sacrifice. And he sanctified Jesse and his sons and called them to the sacrifice. And it came to pass when they were come that he looked on Eliab and said, Surely the Lord's anointed is before me because you look good. That was the eldest son of Jesse. But the Lord said unto Samuel, look not on his countenance or on the height of his stature. He's not abiding in the love of God because I have refused him. For the Lord seeth not as man seeth. For man looketh on the outward appearance. Here it is. But the Lord looketh on the heart. He's looking for the love of God in the heart. Insight number three. Whereas many can present themselves as very impressive, God searches the core of one's heart for acts of true love and faith. Oh, praise be to God. You get it now? So we've got to start looking through the eyes of God, through the lens of God. 1 Samuel 16 8 through 12. I pray this is blessing you. I pray this is blessing you. Come on now. What, what does the love of God look like in our lives? 1 Samuel 16, 8 through 12. Then Jesse called Abinadab and made him pass before Samuel. And he said, neither hath the Lord chosen this. Then Jesse made Shammah to pass by. And he said, neither hath the Lord chosen this. And again, Jesse made seven of his sons to pass before Samuel. He had seven sons. And Samuel said unto Jesse, The Lord hath not chosen these. And Samuel said unto Jesse, Are here all thy children? And he said, There remaineth yet the youngest. And behold, he keepeth the sheep. And that's not a desirable profession at all. He's smelling. He stinketh. He, he's doing something that's menial. And Samuel said unto Jesse, Send and fetch him. For we will not sit down till he come hither. And he sent. And brought him in. Now he was ruddy and withal of a beauty countenance. He had a red hue about him and goodly to look to. And, and Samuel was saying that from the eyes of God. And the Lord said, arise, anoint him, for this is he. He's the one. He's the one. And if, if the love of God is in your heart, guess what? You're the one. Tip number three. Let's remember Dwelling in the love of God is to prioritize obedience to his word that matures the heart in love. You hear me? Obedience is evidence of a heart that is full of the love of God. 1 Samuel 13, verse 13 through 14. And Samuel said to Saul, Thou hast done foolishly. Thou hast not kept the commandment of the Lord thy God, you have violated God's word, which he commanded thee. For now would the Lord have established thy kingdom upon Israel forever, but it's too late. But now thy kingdom shall not continue. The Lord have sought him a man after his own heart, and the Lord have commanded him to be captain over his people, because thou hast not kept that which the Lord commanded thee. There is a price to pay for violating the word of God. The scripture says, to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. But the heart full of the love of God will pursue that which is pleasing unto God that lines up with God's word. 1 Corinthians 13, 9 through 10. For we know in part and prophesy in part but when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done away. 
We're talking about childish things. God is going to just do away with, with all of that, right? Highlight number four. Highlight number four. My God. Somebody say, speak, Lord. Speak, Lord. Let's hear what the Lord is saying. The love of God in our lives should always appear to be growing. Did you hear that? The love of God in our lives should always appear to be growing. We should never be stagnant. We certainly should never be shrinking. 1 Corinthians 13 and 11. When I was a child, I spake as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. Why? Because the love of God in our lives should always appear to be growing. 1 Corinthians 13, I'm sorry, insight number four. Whereas today, the love of God has achieved goodness in our lives. Tomorrow, the love of God wants to achieve even more. And even today, there should be more achieved than there was yesterday. Because the love of God should always appear to be growing. 1 Corinthians 13 and 12. For now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. Don't you see the development taking place? For now I know in part, but then shall I know even also as I am known. There should be growth. There should be perfection. There should be development. Tip number four. Let's remember the lifespan of God's love is eternal. Hold on to that, somebody. Hold on to that. The lifespan of God's love is eternal. So it should continue to grow and grow more perfect even until the perfect day. There should not be a cap on it, but it should continuously expand and expand. It should continuously grow and grow and, and mature and mature. Why? Because that's the nature of the love of God. More and more unto a perfect day. Are, are, are you hearing what I'm saying? More and more, more and more. So that means as I, as I allow God to develop me and, 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 and to mature me, there should be evidence of, of the growth that taketh place. The Bible says that the path of the just is as the shining light that shineth more and more unto the perfect day. Do you hear what I'm saying? More and more. That's Proverbs 4 and 18. Proverbs 4 and 18. More and more unto a perfect day. So that means that as a person is even in my presence, they should be able to see even more and more as they walk with me because the light is growing. The love of God is increasing. 1 Corinthians 13 and 13. And now abide in faith, hope, and charity. These three, but the greatest of these is charity. Let me close out with just the words of, of, of a hymn, a hymn of the church entitled, Love Lifted Me. Listen to this verse. I was sinking deep in sin, far from the peaceful shore, very deeply stained within, sinking to rise no more. But the master of the sea heard my despairing cry from the waters lifted me. Now safe am I. Listen to the chorus. Love lifted me. We're talking about the love of God, dwelling in the love of God, right? Love is what God does because love is who God is. Therefore, love must be what I do because this is what love looks like. Love lifted me when nothing else could help. Love lifted me. Don't throw away the love. All my heart to him I give. Ever to him I'll cling. In his blessed presence live. Ever his praises sing. Love so mighty and so true merits my soul's best song. Faithful, loving service to, to him belong. Souls in danger, look above. Jesus completely saves. This is hope. He will lift you by his love out of the angry waves. And he'll use my hands. He'll use my lips. He'll use my prayers. He's the master of the sea. 
billows his will obey. He, your Savior, wants to be. Be saved today. Love lifted me. What does love look like in our lives? It looks like Jesus Christ in action in you and in me. Let us pray. Father, we just say thank you. Thank you for this word. Thank you for this truth. Now may it materialize and manifest in our lives to the glory of God. And may we taste this victory in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. Heaven smile upon you. Chat if this has blessed you in any way or not. Hit that like button. And please, if you feel so led, go to thenewharvest.org. Hit that given tab and bless the ministry that will enable us to continue to do and do and do. God bless you. In Jesus' name, heaven smile upon you. Love.